song to sing but Jesus, eternal King of kings is He. Upon the cruel cross He suffered and paid the price to set men free.
wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled, by its transforming power, making Him God's dear child.
are all products of the amazing love of God. In other words, you would not be here. No telling where you'd be if it had not been for the rescuing love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here, to worship Him and thank God for that kind of love. The Bible, which is probably the most familiar verse in all of the Word of God. For God so loved the world. I hope we haven't gotten over that. I hope it still amazes us. I hope we still find those wonderful words of life. I'm glad to see you here this morning. Thank you for coming. We have folks that are visiting with us, and we're grateful that you are here. And we're trusting the Lord will do a work among us. I tell you, God wants to do a lot more for us than we want, more than we would want. And I know he desires that. And so we're going to look into his word. We're going to worship his holy name, and we want to do it all to the glory of God. If you're joining us by live stream, thank you. We're thrilled that you've done so, and we pray God will use these means to be a blessing right there in your own home. Let's go to God in a word of prayer and ask his blessing. I know I need him today, and let's look to him, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to come and worship your holy name and look into your word, and Lord, lift up your name in song, and I pray, Lord, for all of this today that we do on this beautiful summer day that you've given us, that, God, we will worship you in spirit and in truth. Many people have substituted that, Lord, for feelings and entertainment. But, God, that doesn't feed the soul. It doesn't change lives, and it doesn't make any difference at all. It fizzles, it's soap bubbles, Lord, it's here and then it's gone. But we want an everlasting work done right here in this place. And we know you only have the wonderful words of life that give, Lord, people a second chance. That causes the discouraged to find hope again. And, Lord, the loss can be found right in the family of God. I pray your word would do a great work in this place today. And may it all bring you honor and glory, for we ask it in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right, well, we're going to start by singing My Redeemer. Would you stand with me all around? We're singing 268. You have a hymn book there in front of you, there normally right in front of the pew that you're sitting or chair. But if you want the words on the screen, which we're all getting used to, we'll enjoy. Either way, we're singing this great song, My Redeemer. Brother Smith is coming.
only a sinner saved by grace. It's number 304 in your book if you'd like to follow along. saved by grace. We don't like to say I'm a sinner, thank God, but I'm glad I can say saved, amen, saved by grace. God is so good. Well, we want to recognize all of those who are visiting with us today. We have several, and we're grateful that you're here. If you'll just lift your hand, our men want to bring you something. It's a gift of our way of saying thank you. So would you lift your hand? If you're visiting, go ahead and do that. Great, right here, and uh, that'll be good there in the middle front. And by the way, this is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who are the parents of of brother, um, oh, well, the man we just hired, what's his name? Matt. Matt Smith, <laughs> still learning, still learning. But brother Matt Smith, and of course, uh, this is Dan and Kathy Smith from Louisville, Kentucky, and we're grateful that they're here and staying a few days with the family. I think they celebrated a birthday in the, in the grandchildren there. So, really, really happy to have the Smiths. We have some other folks visiting. We're as well. I learned this is Travis Collins, Travis and Deborah there. This is our last service before they fly off now and serve the Lord over in Statesville, North Carolina. They're both going to be teaching in a Christian school there. We're thrilled about them being used of the Lord like that. But uh, this is their last service. We'll be sure to get around and say hello to them. And uh, we're grateful for how God is working in their life. Many of you have been praying for Brother Donnie Jones. He's been in the hospital the whole week and some. And uh, he is still there. He wanted to go home so badly uh, before the weekend. He, of course, wanted to be here in church. But, but he is improving. And it seems like it won't be long. But he do, they all appreciate your prayers. Many of you have called and checked on him. And that just goes a long way. Thank you for that. We're also praying for Kathy Clark. Her brother, Delbert Crabtree, passed away last week, or actually this past week, 
and uh, they are going to be having his funeral service today. It's over in Kingston, Tennessee, at what is called the Kikers Funeral Home. From 2 to 4, they're gathering friends, and then at 4 o'clock is the funeral service. And so some of you may be heading that way, and we're going to try to get out a little earlier today. But uh, with that in mind, pray for Sister Kathy and all the family there. And we do rejoice. We just rejoiced. And about a month or so ago, we learned that he received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And that matters at all. That matter. it, Nothing else matters like that. So we're grateful for his salvation. Well, we've got a lot of things in the bulletin for you to stay uh, informed of all that's going on. We're really encouraging folks to sign up for that trip as we're going on our missions trip to Maine. And uh, we need you to sign up. Make sure all the names are in there. We're giving a couple of weeks here for everybody to sign up. The due date for the down payment is later, uh, I think, on July 18. But we need those names now to get folks uh, an arrangement by flight, okay? And so that will really help us. Ladies, you have a special date. We need you to mark your calendar on. And that is for the fall ladies' luncheon, the fall luncheon. And uh, that's on October 30th this year. It's a little later. It's been moved. It's a little later than normal. But October 30th. Mark that calendar. And uh, we want you to be sure to be a part of that. That's going to be a great week. Well, the choir is going to sing now at this time. And Brother Matt leading them. Joy in the camp. Let's all stand together, and the choir is going to lead us, and we're going to have a chorus all together in He Keeps Me Singing. Brother Smith's coming, and let's lift it up all together now. There's within my heart a melody. Singing. 
Would you sing that chorus with us again, please? Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Let's go ahead at this time and bow for a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon not only our offering, but the rest of our service together. Our Father in heaven, we do look to you now needing thee. and We ask that you will bless this offering, every penny used to get the gospel all across the world. Grateful, Lord, for a church that believes in foreign missions, getting the gospel to all the lands and God, there's a great need, there's a great work to be done. And thank you, Lord, for letting us be a part, having a part in your vineyard. I pray you'll bless now the remaining of our service, the scripture reading, the music, Lord, the preaching. Bring, bring you glory and speak to our hearts. God, you know where we are. You know the hurting that's sitting right here. You know the searcher that needs to find his way. And I pray, God, you will do a great Great work in our midst. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, 
And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Thank you, ladies. That was a blessing. I appreciate that. And all oh, wow, what a great, great story there for us in the Old Testament and the life and, um, and uh, example of Job. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13. Again, ladies, thank you. Well done. Matthew 13. Today I'm beginning a new series that uh, it's going to be only in the book of Matthew my microphone going out? Matthew chapter 13. 
Here we go. The Bible says in verse 1, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables. Now notice if you would, as we heard read just earlier there in verse 10, this approach got the disciples' attention. They were scratching their head. What's he doing? Andrew, are you checking this out? Wonder why he's wonder why he's doing that. He didn't do it before. Before he just gave commands and said, follow me. Before he would give illustrations, but to prove his point. Why these parables? He sounds like those Old Testament scholars there in Judaism. Interesting. What do you, what, what's your take, Peter? I'm not saying anything. You always do. Not this time. Whatever. The, the, they're talking to each other. They're wondering, Lord, why are you doing this? And that's exactly verse 10. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And here's his answer. Because it is given unto you. Stop right there. You are blessed to have the Word of God. We are. It is given unto you. And, and, and he's, he's blessing the heart of these disciples by saying, this, this is for you. I prepared this banquet of the Word of God. I prepared this entire meal for you. I had you in mind. But it's not for everyone. And that's the purpose of a parable. Notice what he says. Because it is given, verse 11, unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it is not given. There seems to be an exclusive message. And this exclusive message, which would be the understanding and application of the Word, is only now being received by the believer. But as for the unbeliever, as for the hard-hearted, as for the one who's really not interested and they're only here for the wrong reasons, for them, there seems to be something of the truth withheld. Or it, it just seems... It doesn't make much sense. I don't quite get it. I'm a little bored hearing this because it doesn't, doesn't speak to me. You ever been somewhere where... You just felt like a fish out of water? This is some of the folks there in the multitude. They're looking around and wondering what's going to be on TV this afternoon. I'm applying it today, of course. They're wondering plans, travel plans. Vacation starts tomorrow. Love it when God's people decide to leave on Monday and get back on Saturday when they go on vacation. A little plug in there for you. No, go to Disney and enjoy yourself, but always come back. I always appreciate that. But we have Jesus saying there's a crowd that's they're just not getting it. Why? Because it's a parable. And the parables have an incredible purpose in Christ's teaching here in the Word of God. But the good news is it's for us. He said it's given to you. So folks, you're in good company today. You get in on the parable. And I want you to see this and why it's so. What am I doing? Well, today we're going to talk about the mysteries of the kingdom. It is a mystery. It is a parable that somehow is making other folks scratch their head, but for the child of God, it's a, it's a blessing. It's an act of mercy and grace. This is the mysteries of the kingdom. And what we're going to do for the next few Sundays, God being our helper, we're going to go through Matthew 13 and talk about the mysteries. They're found in parables. There are seven, some scholars say eight if you want to divide one, but there are seven great parables right here in Matthew 
13. And we're going to look at that, beginning a new series on these Sunday mornings, The Mysteries of the Kingdom. Now, to get this, there are a few things that we have to understand. There are three concepts we've got to be sure to get a hold of, all right? The first one is the idea of a mystery to begin with. When you say mystery, you probably think of a treasure hunt or something ooey, scary that you can't understand. But mystery here for us to understand is basically uh, hidden truths from past ages that the scholars, the Old Testament scholars, had a hard time understanding. But when you get to the New Testament, it's unveiled. It's mysteries or truth, rather, truth hidden from the ages past that are now being manifest by divine revelation. So when you read about mysteries, Paul oftentimes when he was preaching or writing to the churches there in the epistles in our Bible, you'll find many times he'll introduce a doctrine and call it the, the mystery of adoption. The mystery of uh, the cross or whatever. And he gives these mysteries. I can't think of a mystery at all, but there are several. But he'll give these mysteries... In his, that's how he introduces them. Well, the reason he introduces it that way is because at one time, these things were not figured out by the Old Testament prophets. This was truth that they really didn't see, that we today are privileged to see in plain and divine writ. Let me give you an example, and probably the best take on a mystery and its understanding is Ephesians chapter 3. Would you turn there? Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writing, says in verse... 3, Paul, again, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he had made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He is talking about Christ's program of his work in the church age being the grace of God that has come to man. And in this age of grace, he says, now this mystery was hailed. Old Testament scholars did not know about the church and the grace age. He says, but now Christ has revealed this mystery to me, and my job is to make it known unto you. In fact, that's what he means right there in verse 8. He says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see. You see, that's the job of the preacher. He takes the Word of God. He takes the Word of God and He makes all men to see. To see what? Paul here is saying, these mysteries that were once held, now I'm making everybody see and understand. Look at it. Hear it. Know it. These are the wonderful words of life, and God has spoken. And so this mystery, again, hidden from ages past, now revealed to us in the New Testament. So when Jesus talks about the mysteries, there's some things that are hidden that's going to be revealed. The next, understanding, not only mystery, but we've got to get a hold of what does He mean by the kingdom of heaven. Now right here, I can take three, four weeks of sermons on the kingdom of heaven and never exhaust it. it is, it's basically the message of the entire Bible. It's like the unfolding of the drama redemption, and that redemptive drama is the kingdom of God on earth. What is that? What's God's rule? His rule and reign. His rule and reign upon this earth. Now, understand the kingdom of heaven is often interchanged, interused by, the use of it is interchangeably with the, with the phrase the kingdom of God. Some Bible preachers and teachers make a distinction between the two and they kind of make a big deal out of it. You shouldn't because Jesus didn't make a big deal out of it. Always make a big deal of what Christ makes a big deal out of, Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll be okay in your emphasis if you'll emphasize what Christ did. And when Christ preached on the kingdom of heaven, you could take this parallel passage over in Luke and Mark and the very same recording incident, he interchanges it with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You'll find them interchangeably uh, often throughout 
the Word of God. But what is it? It's the sphere of God's rule and reign. In fact, it's right here today in this room. The kingdom of heaven. <gasps> Preacher, are you saying the kingdom of heaven, the church? Is just, no, no. There is a distinction between the church and the kingdom of heaven proper in the Bible. However, is the church in God's rule and reign? You better believe it. You better believe it. We are His children. We are under His rule. We are temples of the Holy Ghost. We're in the family of God. And you see, that's what the kingdom of heaven is. The kingdom of heaven is where God reigns. And I like what D.L. Moody says. D.L. Moody says there are two thrones Christ must inhibit. Number one, the throne on high. You know His kingdom is in heaven. In the, pre, in the prayer, of the model prayer that, uh, that we learn, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In that prayer we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a perfect will, a perfect reign of God that is in heaven. And the prayer is, Lord, make it so here. You say, preacher, we live in a terrible world. Yes, it's very dark. Yes, it's very dim and very discouraging. But aren't you glad you could come to a church like this and feel right at home as a child of God, loved, prayed for, feeling like the family that you always feel when you come into such a spiritual kinship? Why is it you feel that way? Why is it you love the fellowship with God's people? Some of you have found that you can be closer to God's people than sometimes your own kin blood. Why? There is something that runs red through your veins and mine. And it it is the love of God that saved our soul. And because He saved us, we belong in His family. And we have something in common about that. What is that? It's the church preacher. Amen. But it's bigger and deeper than that. It's the kingdom of God that's ruling in our hearts. In other words, the church is properly different, but it's all contained in this kingdom. You see, the kingdom goes all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve what? Dominion. He created this world and gave them dominion over the earth and said, go and be fruitful and multiply. Raise up this kingdom of ours and let's enjoy fellowship together. But man chose to rule his own kingdom. He took of the fruit and said, I'll go my way. Adam knew what he was doing. Eve was deceived, but Adam knew. He took the fruit to claim his independence from God. And that's why we're in the mess today. That's why you're in the mess you're in today. You somewhere in your heart and life found it natural to push away God, to live without Him, to say, you know, I've got this. And it's only by the mercies of God that we find ourselves flat on our faces saying, Lord, I need Your mercy. And we're all products of His mercy. Aren't you glad He was there when you called out? Aren't you glad He got a hold of you and got your attention and brought you unto Himself? You could still be out there in this lost, dark, cold world without God trying to make sense of all of this. But you're in the family of God. You're in His kingdom. Hallelujah. You're one of His kingdom kids. Hallelujah. And so God has done this. And this has been His plan all the way through. But you know, in the kingdom, there's always two aspects. You have to understand this. Because somebody might well say, well, the kingdom of heaven is heaven. No, it's not. Do you know there's no sin in heaven? But in the kingdom of heaven, we find evil. There are wheat and tares. There are sheep and goats in the kingdom of heaven. Because of the two aspects, you have to understand this. Otherwise, you'll get confused in your Bible. The two aspects are there are those who profess God's rule and reign. They profess it. They recognize it. They're okay with it, in fact. They may not get real fanatical about it, but they're okay with it. And so they confess, yeah, there's a God. And there's the Lord Jesus. And there is a somewhat of a of an outward, we would say, external profession of it. But the second aspect, and there's always both, is the internal reality. There is an external profession and an internal reality. Preachers of old, Agrippa said, 
there was these professors, in a sense of professing salvation, but not possessors. Uh, made a decision, but there was never really real incision. And you know that's true of the church. It's true even here this morning. I'm afraid. I can't pick them out and choose them. No one can. But God can. And may the good grace of God reveal where you are. That if you just inform, speak of the wonderful things of God, but denying, they have a form of God, but they deny the power. They, they, divide, they, they deny the reality of God's true divine nature. They can speak religiously, they can know things religiously, but it's not real. Because you see, God's work, always remember this, God's work is an inside job. I know in my preaching, this is outward. It's an outside thing. I'm making a call, and I'm preaching the Word, and I'm trying to give the Gospel to everyone I come in contact. That's an outside call. But you know the one that really gets saved? is when they hear God on the inside. They hear that preacher and go, Lord, is, is that me he's talking about? And all of a sudden, the inside job starts happening. Unless the inside job happens, nobody gets saved. We can all smile and look good and call ourselves what we want, but on the inside, we're not true blue kids, genuinely saved by God's grace. We're just professing, not possessing. I did that for years. My papa was the preacher. I'm supposed to be a Christian. So I did what all the other kids did. I got in line and got baptized and went forward and made a profession, did all those things because that's what all the kids did. My papa being the pastor, I should be the first one in line. And so I, I felt the need to go through all of that, and I did. It wasn't about four or five years later I realized that that was just a form. It was just really something I did because everybody else did. It wasn't true and real to me. And God got a hold of my life when I was 15 and showed me, you are lost. I could have went to anyone in the church the night I got saved. I could go anyone to that church and say, what do you think about me? They'd have probably said, if you talk to the right people, they'd have probably said, you're a pretty good guy. They would have probably said, oh, you're saved. I remember when you got baptized. I could go to my mom and my dad and say, Daddy, Mom, am I going to heaven? Sure you're going to heaven. Don't you remember? You prayed and you got baptized. Your own papa baptized you. They could have told me all of those things. But when I had a discussion with the Holy Spirit, on the inside of my heart. It wasn't patting my back. It wasn't make you feel good. It wasn't, oh, don't you worry about it, son. No, it was you're guilty. You're lost. You're without hope. And if you don't get saved tonight, you may never get saved. And I realized right then and there, I better give my life to Christ and quit playing church. And that's exactly what I did. Why? It's an inside job. God does the work on the inside. The kingdom of heaven is not, is not this, this broad brush where we're all children of the Lord. No, we're not. Jesus even made some people really uncomfortable when he said, you're of your father, the devil. Oh, that, that didn't set real good. He didn't get a lot of, you know, clapping after that sermon. I love when people clap when I preach. I do. I know we don't do that here, and that's good. That's fine. I don't need it. It'll make me give you the big head. Oh, preacher, keep going. I would, and you know how dangerous that can be to keep going. We had a gentleman in our church to, to pass away who lived in the black community. And he, he attended our church. We love our, our community there. But, uh, but they all showed up for the funeral. And I preached his funeral. Yeah, it was great. The place was full. But they, 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 from the black church, they had a tradition. If you got good at preaching, they'd clap for you. I felt like, you know, one of those guys on TV. You know, I felt pretty good. I'd say something, hey man! Boy, they start clapping. Mm. And the Bible said, and they got me cranked up. I like that. I enjoyed it. I, I've never had such a time in all of my life. Again, dangerous here because I'll keep going. You don't want that. You don't want that. 
But they enjoyed the preaching. They had a different style, and they clapped for me. You know, I feel like John Hagee. You know, I was all over the place. Give the Lord a hand. Boy, they didn't, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't have to. They were. And it was fun. It was pretty. But when Jesus said, you're of your, you're of your father, the devil, he didn't get, go on, preacher, preacher. No, no, he didn't get that. That was serious what he said. But was he right? You better believe it. he's the truth, the holy truth of God. Nothing comes out of his mouth but truth. He's the living truth. The truth is, it has to be an inside work. An inside work. And that's the kingdom of heaven. Now, what about this thing of a parable? It's kind of scary. Because you said earlier, preacher, I got a little uncomfortable when you said this, that it was like given to us, but then withheld from others. It is. It is. It is what it is. And it is for a reason. I would tell you to consider why did Jesus use parables? Again, the disciples were interested in it, and they thought it interesting. And they even asked him later, said, Lord, why, why are you doing this? Go back, if you have in Ephesians, go back to Matthew 13. Let's look at that again. Matthew 13. Why parables? Well, a parable, it's not hard to understand. In fact, it's a very, it was common, a common form of teaching in the days of Judaism, you know, back in Christ's day. So it wasn't strange. It was just strange that he was doing it to the disciples. What are they? Well, a parable is a story. Uh, we would call it a long analogy. Often in my preaching, I'll give you truths, just like I did a moment ago. I gave you a truth about an inside job and how that when Christ said, you know, you're of your father the devil, that uh, he didn't get a applause, and so I went into the little story about preaching in a church where they all clapped for me. Okay, that was an illustration of, of showing you the difference how when Christ preached, he didn't get that. Okay, so, I, so I'll give you an illustration. However, if I took the whole hour and gave you the story from start to finish how I preached in my church and how the people from wall to wall cheered me on while I gave the truth, I could have taken the whole church service and then said, amen, let's go home be going out the door going, well, what was that all about? He just, the whole hour, he gave the story. Could it be that, that the clapping meant something? Was he trying to pull out that you ought to be more happy when you hear the truth? There ought to be more amen. There ought to be more confirm, or affirmation when I hear truth. Was that his point? And then why did he go into the the story of an Indian story, what, what did it mean? They're preaching a funeral and they're clapping. Is it that, that he was getting across if someone dies in Christ, we should be rejoicing? What was he after in that story? You see what I'm saying? The parable, the whole story, you'd be going out the back door going, okay, what did he mean by that? Because the whole sermon was the story. And that's how Christ preached. And they weren't used to that. They, they had earlier heard him give you know, sermons and application and maybe a, a reference to an illustration like the farmer, what have you. But now the whole thing's a parable. So it's different. And the disciples are going, okay, why, Lord, are you using parables? There's a reason. And it's a scary reason. But it's no scarier than what happens even today when I preach. And it's the truth. It's the, it's the element of reality that we're experiencing right now. What is it, preacher? Jesus explained. He said, verse 11, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, in these parables, you're going to see unveiled truth just for you. You're going to sit there and go, Amen. Yes. Oh, that's, that's good. Isn't that good? But in the same crowd, what? That reality, that, that difference. You, you can go to any form of entertainment, and if, if the guy is funny or if the performer is good, everybody's cheering no matter the background, no matter their spirituality. I mean, when I hear funny people, I laugh with everybody, unless it's off color, of course, and as a child of God, you shouldn't. But... If someone is good, then you get it and it's great, no matter who you are. But in these parables, 
You had two different crowds. You had those that were like, yes, Lord. And you had those that were like, what? Get a load of this guy. And that's by design. What's happening? Jesus has preached the kingdom of heaven. He told them, and so did John the Baptist, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. In other words, here's your moment, Israel. Your king has come, as promised in the Old Testament. Receive him. And there was a legitimate offer of the kingdom. That's why Christ preached it. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was time for Israel to embrace the Messiah. And he will bring in his reign and rule, right? It was a legit offer, but they rejected it. Started with the leaders. Started with the leaders. In fact, if you back up a chapter, chapter 12 of Matthew, you find where they so resisted the Lord's preaching, they attributed His truth and miracles to be the power of Satan. They said, He is of Beelzebub. A demonic Lord of flies. They're given the power to Satan. Jesus then pronounced upon them the unpardonable sin. You remember hearing about that one? Well, what is all of that? It is the Lord dividing the line, just lowering the gavel and saying, you have rejected me the last time. And so what happened is you have in chapter 12 the rejection really of these religious leaders. Now, were there other forms of rejection? Yeah, it intensified. It got worse. There's a lot of scholars that want to just say, no, no, no. Uh, uh, the church didn't come until there was the final rejection, and that final rejection was at Stephen. When they stoned Stephen, he could see the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, and Stephen gave up the ghost, and they want to make, you know, Bible scholars, that, that, that's where Israel had their last chance. And it could have been another extended... Uh, but I want to say this. The, the rejection... It, it was on and on and on all throughout the life of Jesus. Ultimately, ultimately, the cross was Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ. And so they rejected Christ, hung Him on a cross, and now they're rejecting these apostles like Stephen preaching in the power of God, and they stone Him. Unless Paul got converted, he would have continued the same form of rejection and fighting against the truth. But it all started right there in chapter 12 of Matthew, and it just intensifies all the way to the cross, even to the early church age. There's this rejection. And because of the rejection, here it is now, because of the, watch this now. I don't like it, okay? Since you don't like it, I'm not going to cast my pearls before the swine. I've got the riches i got the pearl of great price reserved for those whose hearts are hungry. Reserved for those who won't oppose me. Reserved for those who will, he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So the parable makes a distinction that it is a form of judgment to those who are stiff-necked and they don't care. And at the very same time, merciful, wonderful, Words of life to those who say, Lord, speak, thy servant heareth. To those, Christ said in his sermon in the Beatitudes there on the mount, he said, righteousness shall be filled. In other words, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to touch them. I'm going to give them. Do you know it's still true today? We can come into a place like this and I can preach my heart out and do my very best and that doesn't matter. It matters what God wants to do with it. But as the Word of God is being given, the question is, will you hear? Or will you like, uh, who's got time for all this? this? This stuff. In fact, he's boring me. In fact, he's offended me. People tell me before, once I preached on hell, I had a staff member that didn't like it. I preached on hell and I made, you know, I, I tried to give the reality of what Christ did. Christ, by the way, was a hellfire preacher. And I preached on hell one time and uh, it got around to me that one of our staff members didn't like it. And so this staff member said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not coming back here. Uh, this, this place is just negative. The principal said, well, what do you mean by negative? Well, you know, your pastor, he, um, he, 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 he's, he's negative. 
well, you know, he preaches that hell stuff. Oh. Oh. And I got to thinking about that after he came and told me, and I fired her. I didn't do that. Um, no, but after, after it was all said and done, I thought a lot about that. I didn't go to her. I didn't confront her. I let things work itself out. And a lot of times, most of the time they do. But I got to think about it. Am I negative? Am I just one of these hellfire doom and gloom on you, you sinner? Or is there something of terrible, gross neglect if I give not the truth? If I don't say it the way it is? If I don't give it as Christ gave it? He did not make hell pretty. It is where the worm dieth not. There is a divine, in a sense, wrath, rottening and decaying and lostness that the, that, the, that the person without Christ is going to have to feel and face. And hell is a place, it's a literal place of fire where men and women, boys and girls, will go if they reject Jesus Christ. And the best thing I can do is tell you the truth, but I'm so happy that in telling you the truth that there's good news. The good news is Jesus doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to reject Him. He gives His own self to save you and me. And He did on that old rugged cross. He had to die so that you might live. And so if I give the message of hell, it is true nonetheless. But the good news is there is a Savior. And He's mighty to save. So there have been those who don't like this negative, negativity. And, and, and true, they'll, they'll set their heart against it. They'll set their heart against it. The parable comes along and, in a sense, shields and freely gives the one who wants it. That's the power of the, of the parable. My daughter this week called me last night, in fact, from her week of camp, where she's one of the camp counselors. She had been up in the late hours of the night with teenage girls who are genuinely struggling. And they, 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 you know, they just unload sometimes, and, and my daughter's helping them through their struggles. And she's been trained on how to counsel them in the proper way, and she does all that, but some of them are just... Even hard. Hard. She had one young lady to just absolutely unload on her and began to curse her. So she was angry that the preacher spoke on hell that day at camp. He says, you Christians are nothing but judgmental and, and something to that effect and just literally cussed her. And my daughter's trying to help her to come, come to Christ. And she had nothing, wanted nothing to do with it. And then blame it all on you bigots and you, you, you terrible, you know, and, and know-it-alls and just, and just shoved it away with that hard-heartedness. You know, see, the ideal is it still happens today. There are those who can sit on the Word of God and their heart melts from the Son of Righteousness. But then there are those in under that same sun, their heart hardens. And they want nothing of it. And I would say to you, one is not better than the other. One cannot brag that they're more spiritual than the other. For we all are lost in need of a Savior. The question is, will you receive Him? The Bible says He came unto His own. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto His own. And His own, His very own, received Him not. They want anything to do with Him. But as many as received Him. 
To them gave He power to become the authority to call themselves what? The children of God. Why is it that you're on your way to heaven? Why is it that you can call yourself a Christian? It's not because you had potential. It's not because you had it all figured out. It's not because there was a morality inside of you that was flickering and somebody just kind of blew on the flame. No! There was nothing in you. You were dead, lost in your sins, without hope. But one day Christ was preached. Somebody gave you the truth. And you said, that's me. I need that. And you recall that day, that blessed day, when you gave Him your heart. You ran up the white flag of surrender and said, Lord, here I come. Aren't you glad when you came to Him, He took you in and saved your soul? Oh, isn't it wonderful? He says, I'll never cast thee out. All that come unto me, I'll not cast out. I'm so glad for that. The question is, what will you do? Where is your heart? Where is your heart? He loves you. He's giving Himself for you. Well, you say, well, that's, that's for you Baptist people. No, it's for the world. God so loved the world. John 3.16 that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would prove himself, whosoever were religious enough, whosoever could obey the commandments, no, whosoever believeth, that means I put my faith and trust in the One who died on Calvary. He and Christ and Christ alone. For whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have ever lasting life. Christ didn't come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. He came to give them life. He was the light that sprung up in the darkness. What will you do with it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the Son of God, that Son of righteousness that rose in that dawn of redeeming grace. And I pray, Almighty oh God, that if there be someone here this morning who would say, Preacher, I've been putting this off too long. I want to come to Christ. I want to give my life to Him today. I don't want to go on anymore in my confusion or my doubt. I want to come to Christ today. I pray, O oh Lord, that they would admit and surrender and bow their head and heart and give themselves to You today. I ask, O oh God, that You'll do this great work. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Let's stand together all around the house. We're going to have an invitation. And that invitation is basically this, that if you need Christ, come. Do what millions have done. One by one, when they heard the message, it's me, oh Lord. I'm the one that's standing in a need of prayer. It's me. It's time I get saved. Why don't you make that journey? Millions of untold millions have made one by one. Today, it's your turn. Your turn. Don't put it off anymore. I want you to pray for this one who's at the altar right now. He's come. He's come. Will you come? Will you come? I'll be here at the front to greet you and take a Bible and show you how to receive Christ. I'll pray with you. My wife is here for any lady that would like to come. Need the counseling. Would you do so right now? Brother Matt is leading us in a song 163. I love this. Only trust Him. We'll wait for you. You come right now as we sing together. Would you do that? Come, come on, will you? Some of you Christians might want to come and pray. Let's do the will of God. Will of God today. The Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His word. Will you trust Him? Only, only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. 
He will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. holy band and on to glory go to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow only trust him only trust him only trust him now he will say introduced to you Nate. His last name is Shanks Watson. And uh, Shane is from, or Nate rather, is from, um, from Texas, one of our boys now here at the ranch. Well, Thursday night at the meeting when Kenny Baldwin was preaching, he went forward and gave his life to Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Hey, give him a hand. Amen. Now I'm ready to preach again. Hey, that's good. <laughs> Listen, uh, I keep calling you Nate, but you are Nate. That's good. Nate, I, I'm intimidated because he's so tall over here. But anyway, we are thrilled that God saved your soul and that you, gave, you came to Christ. You gave his heart to you. I'm sure there were probably several others that got saved the same night. Is that true? Yeah. You, you were, yeah. Well, amen. Amen. But you know what? Even though maybe a hundred that went forward, you got in one at a time. And God saved your soul as one of his very own. And he, that's how much he means to. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Nate. Praise God. We will rejoice in that. You can go back and stand. John and Jamie, y'all come on over here. They are coming to unite with our church by letter from Wayside Baptist Church. I just said to them a moment ago, y'all ready to come home? He said, amen. So we have got them home. We do appreciate this couple. If you enjoy and you thank God for the Daltons, would you say Amen. Amen. God has greatly used this man. We don't have a lot we have because without him, we wouldn't have a lot we have. That's what I'm trying to say. And I thank God for this man and his friendship, his support of his pastor. It's an absolute honor to be his pastor and hers. And I thank God for them. And amen. Thank you. All right. Very good. I want you all to go to the back now, and, and Nate as well. Go to the back. And uh, as you leave, I want you to go by and welcome them into the family, and uh, him, of course, being saved, these folks joining our church. By the way, if you're all for him joining this church, would I hear an amen? amen. All right, that's, that's the deal right there. So I should ask for you clapping. That would have been better. But anyway, <laughs> we do rejoice in what God has done, and I'm so grateful for this couple. Y'all go ahead and make your way on back. Brother Nate, go on back, buddy. That would be great. Thank you again for coming, and uh, come back tonight. We'll begin at 6 o'clock. And look to, forward to what the Lord has for us. God bless you for being here. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask your blessings upon our dismissal. I pray for the Clark family, the passing of Delbert. God, that you'll give them grace now for the journey that's ahead of them this afternoon. And Lord, bless our folks. Bring us back tonight. Lord, you know what we need on the table. 
May a banquet of thy holy word be ready to go. In thy name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're at liberty.